Good morning, Swamiji. Good morning. Uh, the first question is from Nancy M. I understand intellectually that God and awareness are the same. In one of your own meditation videos, you said to drop everything and walk into the temple empty with just our love of God slash awareness. I don't know how to love consciousness. How does one love awareness? I know to love flowers, birds, people, the land, all the objects that consciousness is aware of, but I do not know how to love consciousness. I don't know what to focus on. I don't actually have any feelings for it at all. It seems neutral to me. I understand how pure consciousness can be peace because it is like a calm ocean, but I do not understand how it can be bliss and happiness and joy. Please help me understand this. It's actually a very good question. <laughs> uh, every sentence has nuance there. So, first of all, God is consciousness, and then you said, that means I said, that the way to love God is to walk into a temple empty of all your preoccupations, you know, just, just love I and I, I love God. But then Nancy says, I don't understand how to love consciousness. Uh, consciousness, I love the flowers and the birds and the land, but Consciousness does not seem to be anything that I can focus my feelings on, nor do I have any feelings for consciousness. It seems neutral to me. Um, also, she says that, uh, that I understand how consciousness can be peace, but how can it be joy or bliss? You know, consciousness like a calm ocean, if you put it that way. So that sh shows actually a good appreciation for, the, for what pure consciousness is. The question shows that. And the questions she has asked about loving God, uh, those are the easy questions. It's uh, actually the appreciating what pure consciousness is. That is, uh, it's simple but difficult. But the question shows that this person has actually got an insight into what is the nature of pure consciousness. Notice, she says that there is nothing to focus your love on in, if you try to love consciousness. And that's right, there is nothing to focus your love on because pure consciousness, consciousness in itself, is entirely non-object. Uh, it is pure subject, it is you yourself. Anything that appears to you is something that we can direct our love or hatred or liking or dislike towards. So what does Nancy love? She loves the flowers, the birds and the land, presumably people and other you know, all of them, notice they all have an objective component. You can see an animal or a bird or a flower, you can relate to people and talk to people, you can see and you know, experience, sensorily experience the land around you. All of them have an objective component and therefore we can direct our love towards that. It could be love, it could be liking, disliking, whatever, objective component. Pure consciousness is not, uh, is in no way objective. So our pure consciousness and love entirely distinct, is it, there's nothing to do with love at all. But notice, you cannot have love without consciousness. It's only you, the conscious being, who can love, or hate, or desire, or think, or remember, enjoy, suffer. All of these are possible because you are a conscious being. Chat GPT cannot do it. It can't love. Now, the question of God is consciousness and you said to love God, just go without any desires and go into the temple and you love God, but how can you love consciousness? Okay. Now, here are some definitions. First of all, notice, Nancy would agree from an Advaita Vedanta perspective that you are, she is, all of us, we are consciousness. And yet we do love. And according to Advaita Vedanta, Everything is consciousness. In that case, the things that she loves are, um, you know, the birds and the land and the flowers and people and so on. They also must be in some sense consciousness. So in some sense she is loving consciousness. Then what's happening here? An objective element is introduced. That's what's happening here. Here are some definitions. 
What is God? What is a sentient being? According to Advaita Vedanta, what is Nancy? Nancy is pure consciousness, of course. But what else? How is Nancy different from you or me or, or presumably from God maybe? It's that there is a name and a form. There is a mind and a body. There is a personality involved. So it's pure consciousness plus uh, there is a name of an appearance, an activity, a personality, a mind with its own characteristics, a body with its own characteristics and history. Then you call it Nancy. Are you or I? So it's pure consciousness plus mind, body and so on. Similarly, what is God? Yes, it's true that God is pure consciousness, but just in the same sense as you are pure consciousness or I am pure consciousness or Nancy is pure consciousness, God is also pure consciousness in that sense. Pure consciousness with something else. The traditional definition of God and sentient beings in Vedanta, the definition of God, Ishwara in uh, Sanskrit, in, in Vedanta, you will find this definition in Vedanta Sara, manual of Vedanta. The definition is, Samashti Agyana Upahita Chaitanya Consciousness associated with Maya is God. That sounds very theoretical. But it's not. It's just like us. You are consciousness associated with a causal body, subtle body and physical body. Physical body, the one which you see. Subtle body, the, when we introspect inside thoughts, feelings, emotions, ideas, desires, memories, personality, that's the subtle body. Beyond that, the seed state of the subtle body, um, you know, what we experience in deep sleep, when the external world is as it were switched off for you, the dream world is switched off for you, and you remain in a seed state. That's the causal body. So there's a causal body, subtle body, and uh, the physical body. And this is a sentient being. Similarly, God uh, is in, in Sanskrit or in Vedanta, Ishwar or Bhagavan, or Saguna Brahman, Brahman with attributes. Notice, uh, here is the answer to Nancy's question. Pure consciousness itself in the in Vedanta is called Nirguna Brahman. Brahm, consciousness itself without any attributes. That's why pure, without any attributes, without any characteristics. But God in Vedanta is called Saguna Brahman. Consciousness with attributes. With attributes. So what are the attributes of uh, God? What are the attributes of Nancy or you or I? Subtle bo uh, causal body, subtle body and physical body with each of them having their own in unique attributes. And what, is, what are the attributes of God? Exactly the same. Causal body, subtle body, physical body. I said, you, God is a physical body. Well, in Vedanta, pure consciousness plus Maya. Maya is the causal body of God. And I will not go into what is Maya and all. You need a whole series of lectures on Vedanta then. And then there is a cosmic mind. Hiranyagarbha, it's called consciousness plus causal, causal body plus the minds, all our minds, nicely linked by the cosmic in, in, internet. <laughs> so the cosmic mind. And then the cosmos itself, the physical universe, all living beings and all the so called non living universe, all of it together is the physical body of God. So pure consciousness or Atman, Brahman, Brahman itself, plus Maya, plus cosmic mind, plus cosmic body. This is the idea of God. And uh, in Vedanta, God can appear because the God is limitless. God can appear to the devotees, can be experienced by the devotees in any number of forms and names. God with names, without form. God with names, with forms and multiple forms. That which is essentially formless can assume multiple forms. Many people don't understand the Hindu idea of God with form, you know. Krishna, Ram, of course they are incarnations. But then Vishnu and Devi and Shiva, why such forms and such fantastic forms? Well, my simple answer to that is, you are essentially formless, you are pure consciousness. But you are here, you are here with a form. That's why you have a chair. <laughs> so, if you can have a form, uh, can't poor God assume a form? <laughs> yes, God can have any number of forms. Now you can love God. Because God has attributes which are lovable. It might be difficult to love people, but it's easy to love God. 
God is uh, uh, all loving, God is just, God is merciful, God is the, uh, all omnipotent, omniscient, omnipresent, uh, all kinds of auspicious qualities. So uh, God is attractive, God is lovable. In that sense, the second sentence that you said when you go into a temple, that's where that the context of what I said was, how do you love God? And there I mean God with attributes. I'm not saying that you go, go and love the pure being, pure consciousness. I think the greatest of philosophers also would find it difficult to love pure consciousness. But when we um, practice the way of devotion, bhakti. So between the first sentence Nancy wrote and the second sentence is the shift from the way of knowledge to the way of devotion. That has to be kept in mind. And that is a shift from Nirguna Brahman to Saguna Brahman. Pure consciousness without any attributes to pure consciousness with all blessed attributes which make it God. Now, when we go to love God, what happens is what intervenes in between are our own desires. One can go into a temple with, one, with desires. Most people do. That's why many people go to a temple or a church or anything. Our desires will be satisfied, will be fulfilled. But the best way to love God is to approach God just because I love you. It's, uh, I am not there because you can do things for me. You know, magically make my life better. God can, but I'm not going there for that. Then you see, bhakti becomes very powerful. Love becomes very powerful. I leave everything. Just as you enter um, you know, a temple and you leave your shoes outside, similarly leave your desires, your problems, your identity as a, a parent or an employee or a boss or whatever it is, you leave it outside. And you come to God just because I love thee. Then you will see love will be very, not only possible, very powerful, very effective. She said that I cannot, uh, I don't have any feelings for consciousness. Of course you don't. If you did, then I would say you did not understand what consciousness is. Consciousness is that which through a mind has feelings. Consciousness is that through a mind and a body does actions. But consciousness in itself is without any feelings or without any actions and it's entirely subject. It's entirely non-object. So you cannot direct feelings at consciousness. Um, and that's right. Then what happens, one might ask this question, what happens then, you said that then God is pure consciousness and I and God are one in that sense. Yes, I am pure consciousness with a mind and a body uh, and I become a sentient being. And God is pure consciousness with a cosmic maya and cosmic mind, cosmic body. But apart from the mind and body, apart from these attributes, as pure consciousness, which I am, God is also that and you and God are one. That's the meaning of tat tuamasi, that you are. That's the highest Advaitic realization. You are that. Um, how can we ignore the mind and body? We can. There's a whole Advaitic teaching about it because these are appearances in consciousness. You know, the Advaitin would say that the person going around in the dark, you know, in a village, uh, suddenly sees, somebody sees a snake and gets scared. It's a rope, but mistakes it for a snake and gets scared. And um, yells, watch out, there's a snake there. And his friend says, no, it's actually a flower garland. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, the, and when they go, and the wise person who knows what it is says, it's not a snake, not a flower garland, not something evil, not something very good also. It's, it's a piece of rope. Similarly, Brahman appears to us in all these different ways. And you can ignore the snake, you can ignore the flower garland, because... It's not really a snake. It's not even really a flower garden. It is Brahman itself. In that case, you and, and God are one reality. But that is a matter for knowledge, not for directing your devotion. Again, I'm thinking what Nancy might say to this. <laughs> then she would say that you have completed full circle, so we are back to where we started. If I and God are one reality, then what do I love? But notice, when you say, what do I love? You're already shifting into your personal identity. As the witness consciousness to you, the entire universe appears, plays around and disappears. And you are like this light, light shining. There's no question of a person loving some other, some other thing, another person or the land or the flowers or the birds or God. 
But notice that even after all this knowledge, we are all again back into our personal identity. It's not that once you get this knowledge, this enlightenment, even a person who has got non-dualistic enlightenment, uh, I am Brahman, does the world actually disappear for such a person? No, it does disappear only when the person goes into samadhi in deep meditation. Otherwise, when the person opens his eyes and looks around, there's the world again, exactly as we see it. And then how do you relate to the world? You relate in the knowledge that I am this, whatever it is, a person, a place, um, or God, we are one reality. And you also relate to, uh, to, to, to that as an enlightened person, your relationship to everything would be a sense of oneness and love. It will be expressed, oneness will be expressed as love. The knowledge of the oneness of all things, that is Advaita Vedanta. That knowledge is expressed as love for all beings and God especially and in action. Karma, action, service is love made visible. You're thinking, oh, you Swami has a way with words. Not my words, Khalil Gibran. <laughs> <laughs> service is love made visible. Our work is love made visible. Okay, I'll leave it at that.